I think everything will become very bad and we will have terrible consequences. But most of the time, luckily, I'm becoming integrated. Even if I'm old and my students are much fitter with using the media than I am, and I have to ask them, excuse me, could you help me because I want to do this with me out. And they immediately do everything. So I envy them, actually. I am, I am integrated. Most of the Sometimes I think of the catastrophes and, you know, all the things we heard about, all the fake news and all these things are perhaps less controllable. That humankind lies, tells, you know, we know the human condition. The question is whether the media can expand the human condition to make it worse. Actually, I think that we have seen in the 20th century things before the media came, they didn't need the internet, but perhaps they were able to do it because there was no internet. So we do agree that there is much, in spite of all the lies and all the fake news, if in some country there is something going on which is very wrong, it comes out. We see it in television, we see it in the media. So the discussion, you know, of the advantages and disadvantages of communication, in spite of all the fake news, I am positively impressed that I think the overall sum is positive. There is more transparency. And etc. So, but let's think of school. School is that one place and family where we have the possibility of not nudging but educating. Telling them, you see, this knife is a very dangerous thing. You have to get used to it and therefore you don't use it. I forbid, stringly forbidden, they do it, but you forbid. And one good day you say, now you are able to use this very dangerous thing called knife. Fine. With the media, I think of something similar. And I have signed with my colleague Ulrich Hofrage a document saying that smartphones should be forbidden in elementary school. Forbidden. If you come with your smartphone, then you are brought to the director and then your parents are told those things. Expulsion, okay, forbidden. But after that, and in spite of being the smartphones being forbidden, in elementary school now we have lots of media and lots of good things which make life easier, especially math, I would say. So that's fine, but not the smartphones. And this is another chapter. But let's think. So there is lots, lots and lots of outsourcing today with the media. Even in papers, as you see, the computations and the statistics are, are done by one of the persons, if we are lucky, using R or something, and we trust them. So there is a lot of outsourcing. It's not as in the times of Euclid. But think of games in school. Th games in school are becoming more and more popular because gaming is an instrument to teach concepts in mathematics. So this is a good effect. For instance, mastermind. For Mastermind, you have several versions. You can play the plastic thing, or you can do it in urns with balls, and children guess the composition of the urn by throwing one, you know, one ball at a time. So you can play Mastermind in a very embodied con cognition way, and you can play it on the console. So the question is, what do you think works better to understanding something close to entropy? This is the truth. We have done studies and published. Actually, the urn with the balls. So if we want to test them on how much do they guess about the composition by extracting or playing it and extracting with the plastic thing or doing on the console, see there, this is good propaganda for embodied cognition. It is true. They learn better with the urn and the balls and extracting. Okay. You know, guess who? Again, a play a game that teaches you information. What is the good strategy? How many bits, how many questions do you need? Again, there is this version, there is the console game, you can play it in class on the screen. And again, results have published, Jonathan Nelson, myself, Vincenzo Krupi, it is better to do it embodied, to take the cards off. You can measure the results, okay. Fine, you know this very old game invented in India. I don't know what is in Ludo, I think is in English. I never know what is the name in Italian. In, in Parchisi, it, it was called Parchisi. Okay. Parche in it in Colombia, but not in Italian. Uh, 
Okay, the Italians tell me what is the name of this. Parquet? But can you play it? So, non ti arrabbiare. Mensch, ärgere dich nicht. This is like in Germany, don't get angry. Okay, so these games you can play again. Even Parquet or Mensch, ärgere dich nicht is very useful to estimate risks. Here, for instance, in this position, suppose you're playing that and you're green and you want to go to the house which is here, your house green is here, and green, it is your turn, and you throw a one. Which one would you move? The one on the right there or this one on the left if you have thrown a one and you have to move? So children will say, and not children, children, adults, I move with that one. But see, the next one, the blue, can throw a four or a two to throw you out if you go with that one. Do you agree? Because if you go with that one, the distance from blue to the green will be four here and still is two there. So it is much better to move this one because blue will only have the chance of beating you with a three, throwing a three, a three here and a three there. So if you want to teach risk, you use this game. What, how, what is the dis risk reduction if you move with the green on the left side? You can, you know, consider this question. And it's a very good, it's a disc risk reduction of 50% if you want to express it like this, etc., etc. From two out of six, because it's two throws that throw you out, a two and a, 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 a two and a four, so it's two numbers out of six you get out if you move that one and here is only one which is only the three that throws you out and only throws you one of these figures okay so you can teach a lot with gaming but but there is fortnite and there is minecraft and children play it wherever they can in the toilets of the schools they used to smoke they, from, they play Fortnite. <laughs> they play Fortnite. Have you analyzed Fortnite? Yes. I'll tell you. So you do learn a lot about risk. There is an island and there are two countries or, you know, two peoples or two. And they are, of course, enemies. And so they do all sorts of bad things to each other. And they can prove, they can kill, but it's not killing. There are no shots. This is the propaganda. They, you don't shoot. You don't bomb cities. But you eliminate. Okay? And what is funny is that you can get new stuff all the time. Not only new weapons. But no, no. Please, Cesare. Yeah. Your friends. <laughs> And, uh, communication, uh, telephone. Evolve. Armies and things. Protect, yeah. And, uh, your build, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they, you can elim you can distract the uh, strategies of your, uh, you know, of your competitor or your enemy. Is it, is it more it's extremely visual. But, so, but, but you don't see bodies. You don't, ah, the bodies it's interesting. So you don't see blood, that is for sure. Perhaps later, if you're very interested in this game. You see, he knows lots about it. Because my nephew, who is his son, who is very good in math, actually, and writes nice compositions, every spare minute in school, or especially in his house, no, it's good, no, that's good. But in Germany, some play in school. That, you know, yeah, there has to be control. So, lots of guys play in school. And you have to forbid that. In any case, his son, all, all the time he's at home, basically, except for the food intake, he is doing this. Okay. So that's why he's... So or viewing videos about... Others playing. This is a fantastic thing. Yeah. So he's viewing people in the United States playing a fortnight and just looking at it as if, you know like you go to movies to see wars some of us are not me but you know you and they have fun seeing how other guys play whether they play better there is a lot of buying again a very subtle thing or get of getting new things not just weapons ways of looking dresses stuff 
Yeah. Dance. dance moves. You can, you know, there is a, a when world. You win, when you win, you, you dance. When you win, there is a dancing to celebrate, okay? But things would become static in the end, as they become in countries, basically, or, or you know, in, in our world, if they grew and grew stronger, the two enemies, Russia and the United States, they grew stronger, and then some sort of metastability would arise which we know very well in our world. There are these periods of metastability and there is not too much, you know, war around. And there are periods of incredible dynamics in this business of playing, you know, playing Fortnite with your enemies, your real enemies. So this thing would happen there too, but, and here comes the psychology of the game, the island becomes smaller and smaller. So in the process of playing, your territory, there is this catastrophe, so to speak, that the territory where these two countries live becomes smaller. So that forces you to more war because you're constantly defending your territory. All right, so Fortnite, even if I were Umberto Eco and a very integrata, I think Fortnite should be looked at. They use fantastic psychologists to develop this game. It's constantly in development. There is another one, Minecraft, which I'm not going to describe, but these games are interesting because they cause these passions. Because, you know, very healthy guys, it's not drugs, they play some soccer and they do this a lot of time. So this is interesting. Continue, but let's go back to mathematics. And as you know, the importance of representation. Representation and visualization is in mathematics an important issue, perhaps one of the most important issues. And the Greeks, as we know, had not a compass, they had a thread, but it worked like a compass and they had a straight edge and they developed the most fantastic work in the history of mankind, besides the Bible, of course, which is these 13 books of Euclid's elements. Okay, the Euclid's elements were written centuries before Christ, and they were written on papyrus, and there are some facsimiles of these pieces of work. But in 1482, when printing came about, in 1482, a German guy called Radolf you know, wrote down this in a fantastic writing and did all these drawings. So in 1482, you had this book of Euclid's elements with fantastic drawings. And it still exists. You can find it in the libraries. There are facsimiles, etc. So the great advantage of having the media was to produce something that people could have. And in fact, Euclid's elements were a book that people had second to the Bible you know, in the houses, even in the 19th century, people had Euclid's elements. Maybe they didn't read them, but it was there. Now, Euclid's elements have been redrawn in 1838 by an English guy called Oliver Byrne, and he used colors. He used colors, and this is fantastic progress. Some books of Euclid are on arithmetic and some are on these geometric theorems. It is much easier to understand proofs with these colors. It's like natural frequencies. You change a bit the format and then, ah, that's it. Okay, so you see this progress in, and I will show more progress very soon because we know what we can do now. But I want to tell you about another important book which appeared in 1498. It was a book by a genius, Luca Pacioli, who made a compendium of the existing mathematics at the time, not geometry, some geometry, but only for perspective and, you know, drawing, etc. So it's, it doesn't contain Euclid, but it does contain a lot of geometry. And there are, it's more than one book, but I want to recall to you that, of course, these guys in the Renaissance were very much aware of the marketing power of very good representations. So the, the person who do the did the representations for this book was a great person called Leonardo da Vinci. Can you imagine? These books are illustrated. The illustrations you see here, this is Leonardo da Vinci. And the Italian that you read here is lots of fun. 
because this is already Italian. That was another new thing. Not just, it was not Latin, you know, the Bible was in German and this was in Italian. So there is the word pancia, la pancia sotto, la, which is very funny. I read this with a lot of pleasure because words... Hmm? Before Galileo. Yes. Galileo, yes. No, but this is before Galileo. So the in physics it was certainly Galileo. So Luca Fattoli was aware of all, you know, all the factors of a good representation, which this perspective work and solid representations are very important, but I want to tell you that of course there is, in Europe, we have this dialogue between two, at least two very important civilizations. And Islam had made an incredible amount of progress in representation. And if you go to the Alhambra, you will find here, you see, in all the ornaments that they place there, all of the 17 groups of tessellations that exist. So you see that they are different. You look at this ornament, it's a little bit from, different from this one, and you experience that and your intuition tells you that there are more than one, but you don't know how many, there are 17, and this is important. And today, of course, you have what you can do with your hand. This is Steliana, she's 10 years old, and she drew this freely. And it is one of the important groups. She didn't know, but what sh this shows is that children have an intuitive, we all have an intuitive sense of ornament, of symmetry, of translation. And she did this, which contains one of these groups, but you can download an app called Eye Ornament. And in Eye Ornament, you can draw, you can draw, draw all, you can draw, it costs six dollars. And you can do the ornaments and you, they tell you a bit. It's not a proof, but if you click on math, because they bring an M with, uh, on the tip, you can learn something about this theorem, that there are 14, and that these 14 actually are in the Alhambra. Okay, now, of course, you can prove this theorem. A la Euclid, you see what he told, uh, you know, these books, these 13 books of Euclid were a lesson in theory. He, he had to reorganize everything, put the first things first, and then deduce, deduce, deduce. So there is a German guy, Andreas Speiser, who in 1926 went to Alhambra. He sees these things, he counts those that he considers different, and he proves a theorem in this book. And this fantastic, you see there's some ornaments in the cover, is called Die Mathematische Denkweise. So he says in the book, you can have the ornaments, but if you're a mathematician of this certain kind, very, you know, Greek, Greekly oriented, then some moment you say, I want to understand why. Or is this perhaps fake news in the sense that you convert them, but they actually are the same, and you can prove a theorem, a long theorem, many pages, that these are 17 and that they're all at the Alhambra. There are many, you know, very primitive illustrations compared to photographs that we can do today. So this is important. And now, of course, in school, we can, we use, of course, some of the softwares and we can prove like this. Is this a proof? Okay. So look at the steps. If you look at the steps, you can see it is a proof. It is very quick. It corresponds to the so-called Chinese version of Pythagoras, the, of the proof of Pythagoras theorem. And it is, you can do it of course with a drawing, but here it's more difficult, you have to explain everything. Or of course you can do, oh sorry, I will show it again, just... No, oh, it doesn't move anymore. Okay, but now, the good thing about proving is that theorems can prove theorems. You know, th uh, not theorems, computers today, computer programs, you can prove theorems. And this is one of the predictions of Herbert Simon, this, our guru, really, Euclid, and then Herbert Simon, almost, <laughs> passing through Galileo and Luca Pacioli, because he said in 67, computers will play chess and will win, computers will prove theorems, and they do, and computers will compose reasonable music, and they do. Yeah? So, he was right in many things. 
many, many things. In Psalms, he was not aware of all what would happen. So he certainly was not aware of the effects of the internet. It would be nice, you see, it was those thought experiments. What would he say if he were here? Okay, but yeah, computers prove theorems. And of course, the question is how much do you put in the knowledge base so that they prove reasonable things? So it's still humans deciding what is the knowledge base and what are the axioms. From there, practically, they, the computers even decide what they want to prove. Yeah? You can put them and they prove theorems. So the only thing computers don't do yet, and this is the most recent book which I recommend. It's written by Gila Hanna, who's our colleague in you know, a project we have with Laura. Gila Hanna is a specialist on proof. She worked on proof all her life. She is a math educator from Israel and she lives in Canada and she works on proof. So she has gone through the process, you know, when we had to fight to keep some proofs in school. Some battles are won and some are not, you know. So I could talk about the variance in this, you know, the United States, Germany. Proofs somewhat disappeared, somewhat. You don't prove so much in school, so you don't put too many prove this, prove that, as you did before, you know, in, in the 70s. You still proved a lot. If you have an isosceles triangle, then the basis angles are equal, etc. People do, did that in school. You do less, but you do a lot of argumentation. So the competency is now called Beweisen und Argumentieren. Prove and Argumentation. And argumentation plays the most important role. So the desideratum today is that children in school see pictures and can tell you, you see, this is congruent to this, so from there you can see, and they are approximate, but, as sti but it's still, you know, somehow the deductive style. Okay, so here in this book, which just appeared, you see comments on the good effects and the bad effects. So some mathematicians use the computer to test whether the proofs are right. This is great. The computer can tell you this proof is complete. This proof has a hole. This is fantastic. Because as we know, even Andrew Wiles, who, you know, who won a Greek prize because he solved Fermat's last problem, there was a hole for years, and Nakayama, a Japanese guy, filled that hole. So proofs are a very difficult thing, and it is somehow a social element to decide that the proof is now correct. So how do we impose that on the computers, so that the computers know this is complete? That is a difficult topic, and people talk a lot about that. But it is true that computers can prove theorems, and what is not yet possible is that computers choose lines of research. So you put the knowledge base, and a human, you know, a good mathematician would know, okay, now it would be interesting to see. Andreas Speiser sees these ornaments and thinks, hmm, we have to prove this, or this is an interesting topic. Of course, computers don't do this. Okay, so my, in my, this is, how you can prove in school Euclid's division lemma, which is, of course, very old. And now, quickly, the important thing in school today is to teach them to model. This is from school, you know, from school education, math education. You pick a real problem, a situation, you model it mathematically, and you solve the problem and you present your results after validating. Okay, you see, solving problems is the business of life, so if math teaches you to model, this is very good. Euclid did not do that. So where does the tradition come of modeling? This comes from Persia, of course, from the East. These guys, al khwarizmi from whose name the word algorithm comes. This is the 8th century. al khwarizmi wrote a book and you know, he modified the, in, the numbers that came from India. So these numbers that you see here came actually from India, the decimal system. The Romans had a very dysfunctional number system, but the Indians had a fantastic number system. al makes it perfect and introduces real computation. So you can find in his books more than one. Does he say that we 
have one angle and then two angles? Yes, he counted so the angles. The yeah, in fact, he transformed, you see, look, this thing is very important. The, the numbers, when you see the Indian system and you go into the internet and find the, the Indian signs and the Arabic signs, they are not exactly this. He transformed this and it's his idea that the angles should correspond, which is irrelevant. I mean, they could also not correspond, but he, this you can find in one of his books, that he, there is this counting of angles and of course zero, which used to be, used to be a point, should be a figure with no angles. Okay. So algebra is a word that comes from the title of this book. Now, al hitaf al muhtashar fi hishab al jabr wa al muhabala. Is this correct? Al jabr wa al muhabala. Ah, al jabr wa al muhabala. Okay. So this book is the book about you know mixing around in equations, putting one term to the other side, which is one of those two activities, and compensating on both sides. It's the book about compensation and what is Jabra? Jabra is determination. Ah. So everything that is determined already. Mohabala is uh, the one that you were talking about, argumentation. Uh -huh. so But you compare equations, you don't compare arguments, you compare uh, uh, yeah. equal. You equal two things. So this is actually already algorithmic. Yes. Yeah. So this is the book. And, <laughs> and this is what we do today in his according to what he taught us. Namely, if you have this equation, then you have to add three both sides which is like compensating, and then you have to transform. So this, he introduced a word which was translated, it was the word shy, which meant thing. It was translated into Latin in England, and it became X. So from shy to X, there is this process of, you know, westernizing these concepts. And okay, I won't, pre I won't present the live demo, which would be very nice, but I'll tell you, Abandon algorithms. Algorithms come from al khwarizmi although the oldest algorithm is the division algorithm in Euclid. And for finding the greatest common uh, divisor, this is explained in Euclid. So Euclid does have in his arithmetic part some algorithms. Yeah? But the conceptualization of algorithm is of course al khwarizmi And the word algorithm comes from there. Okay, in statistics we have if there is one subject that profits most from the computer and digital, it is statistics. Look at this girl work, working there on a whiteboard. The whiteboard is great because it also can, you can do some computations on the side. You can use all the softwares like Tinkerplot, which is a wonderful software for statistics at an elementary level. And you see here students, these are students in fourth class working you know, with tinker plots, doing things like that, counting. So this is some beginning of statistics, and you can do that already in fourth class. And, you know, how could you not recognize that this is fantastic? Yeah, having tinker plots is fantastic. Okay, now think back to Euclid. You see, the oldest theorem in the history of mathematics is this one. It tells you that if you have a semicircle and a triangle with a vertex on the circle, that angle is a right angle. This is before Euclid. And it is some sort of fake, nobody knows where were the proofs, whether Thales knew how to prove this. Of course, Euclid organizes those elements to prove this thing. And you prove it using isosceles triangles, etc., and using that the sum of the angles of a triangle is two right angles. You need it here. Shabnam. I asked her on the street, do you remember how to prove this? She remembers, because it's a very beautiful proof and it's a little bit visual. I don't present this proof now. But GeoGebra, which is a fantastic program, produces, if you want, many triangles, one after the other. You can, you know, with a click. And it tells you always how large is the angle. So children see this. Young students see this and they are convinced, even if they have no proof. Or they cut another method, you can cut many triangles and measure out those angles, and it is basically 180 degrees. So there is an empirical approach. 
but there is the proof. And, you know, you, we can guess, discuss whether it makes a lot of sense or not to have the proof. So, consequences. The consequences is that the ideal classroom look like this. I will not go over it. You have a whiteboard, you have two cameras, you have beamers, you have media input, everyone has a, a, a tablet. All these children have tablets or young students. They work on the tablet. Everything is registered, of course. The teacher has the control of those tablets. And, of course, you have access to the Internet. So this is the dream of the informatics guys. And they try, you know, we have in Baden-Württemberg, the, the minister wants informatics in school. And this is, of course, fantastic. But, you know, media, I could go very quickly on these statistics, how much is used today. And you see books are disappearing. Books, Internet, smartphones. This is not elementary school, this is in Sekundarstufe, which is a gymnasium. A lot of online videos, very little books, disappearing, okay. Technology, lots of technology, but, you know, there, is some, there are differences. And frequency of media uses in class, you know, every day is very little and less than once per week is this. But there is practically 31% use it once per week. And now the consequences. Please look at this. This is the Waldorf School in Silicon Valley. They have no smartphones, no media of any kind. They draw with very beautiful crayons and play the flute. And the owners of Google and Apple and all those guys pay a lot of money to have their children in the Waldo school. So they're interviewed and li listen, why don't you send them to one of those schools with all these media? These don't exist yet, but you know, this is what we're going to. And they say, you know, they will get the media anyway. So let them grow up in this place with the beautiful colors and you make friends and you write poetry. This is their they will get the smartphones anyway, and they'll play Fortnite in the bathrooms, not in the school, but this, they learn other things. So this is a consequence which I consider very serious. And although the trend is to have more and more technology in classrooms, and one can say, yes, it is fantastic, you see there is the world of school. There are those guys telling you, listen, the important thing was friendship, you know, to I know a girl who fought with her boyfriend and then it was, it appeared in the media and she was very sad that her best friend put something, posted something in one of those social networks. So everybody in the classroom know, knew that she had been fighting with her boyfriend and she told her mother she wanted to change school because it, she didn't want this, she didn't want this public gossip in the network. Okay, so the discussion is infinite, but I see these two trends. On the one side, the most technological class you can imagine, which can be seen as good, and on the other side, thinking of the world of school, thinking of what other values have to be taught and how can they be taught without nudging, with people understanding what they're doing. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, why, in your opinion, some uh, analogic games works better yeah. than uh, digital uh, yes. games from a cognitive point of view. Yes. Uh, yes. Which are the reasons behind the Yeah, there are the reasons. Difference. So, as you can imagine, the, there is the embodied cognition group. Do you know those guys? I work with them. So, if you learn to add with your fingers, a lot of a long period with your fingers and then with drawings and then with cubes and one good day have the calculator you learn better okay but now the games there is a difference between looking at the screen this is what the embodied cognition I can send you papers the, looking at the screen and just seeing things change so in this surface is much less strong in your brain say cerebellum even, and the con connections to that is much less than when you do 
things with your hands. So the urn with the balls, yeah, is the best thing. So you see, this is... You, the problem is uh, understanding why. Because your brain works more, so this is the workload on memory, and you have many more impulses, not just the visual thing going on on the surface, but the imp yeah, yeah. There is one experiment that just telling children, taking the, the, the iPads off, you know, having all the put, put in another room, and they work on these games, they are better. Can you imagine? I, I can send you, I have literature even, you know. So it, it is one of the things, on spite, in spite of all the advantages, playing in the Waldorf school with those urns and balls, etc., is of advantage. I do have a quick follow-up yeah. on this point because yeah. uh, it's actually kind of a personal story. My wife is a teacher and she oh, oh, oh. The geography and one of the big problems teaching geography to, school, to, to, to kids in middle school is to explain geographical projections yes. because they don't get it uh, and they don't get the need for it. I mean, what's the problem? What's the big deal of just representing yeah. the word as it is? And I mean, after many years, she discovered that the best tool to do that Take is them. an orange. No, it's an orange. Oh, it's an orange. You give them an orange, you have them peel the orange, and then try to flatten the... And it's just impossible. And then you realize why you need a <laughs> yes. projection. And she's a very high-tech tech guy. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, she is completely with you on the whole thing that sometimes... Sometimes, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's one of those things where at the end you say one of those statements, a time for this, you know, it's in the Bible, so they knew, a time for this and a time for that. So there is a time for a lot of technology and there's also a time to do the orange and to play with the urn. So even more than before, I am for this complementation and for pluralism of teaching methods. But let's keep the technology as well. Do you agree, Constantinos? Good design. Yeah, you can also have an orange and make a mess on the floor. Yeah. Rather than that clothes, it's a good use. Why? Because an adult has known what the domain is, they understand how it's structured, they've got a good representation. They touch they it. The and then they, and they touch it. An and expect it to do the work. Yeah. You know, the iPad has got a designer in there who's gone come up with pedagogy. That designer is often somebody in America and you know very good technology who may not know how the children learn. Yeah. And Of course. It's a knife. Technology is again the knife. It is very useful, but you can do very bad things. And the question is, what can solve that? Just education and forbid. You know, there is some forbidding. And I am for it. You see, I signed this thing with Ulrich Haufrage. It should be forbidden to, ha tra to have a smartphone in the cl with you in elementary school. It should be forbidden. Period. Knives are forbidden, technology, uh, smartphones are forbidden. Not technology of the kind that you saw, but the smartphones. Do you agree? <laughs> I, I practiced it on my daughter. And it didn't work. But I don't have an alternative. <laughs> <laughs> don't well. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so if you have ideas, you know, there is nothing more actual now than talking about this digital in education. Everybody does it, and good ideas. The embodied cognition guys are winning some battles, and the Waldorf School guys, you know, Waldorf School is expanding in the United States. Be prepared, in Italy too, okay? So, it's in, an interesting discussion. It is the discussion of the moment. Okay, so, thank you again, Laura. And, uh, uh,